Note that this is the, the next version of 235 that will be released. Uh, and it does have uh, the, the bug that was introduced in uh, 235.3, I believe, um, uh, fixed there. Um, if you're using 234 or below, this should work as well. Um, but the demo instance, which has a, does have this bug um, that causes an issue where the, the track identity layer appears to load for a very long time, like this you can see here. So uh, let's go ahead and create this uh, tracked entity layer. I'm going to remove this layer. I'm going to go ahead and click uh, Add Layer, go to Tracked Entities, select a tracked entity type. In the demo instance, we have Malaria Entity and the program Malaria Case Diagnosis Treatment and Investigation. I am going to then also select display relationships. So we can display tracked entity relationships from index case to cases. I'm uh, going to go ahead and do that. Do you see that there's also a case to focus relationship type, um, which would be between this program and another program, which is malaria focus areas. Um, at, but I'm going to use the index case to cases relationship type here. Um, Index case doesn't really make a ton of sense necessarily in a malaria context, but um, the, this does show that you do have the ability to uh, have relationships between different um, uh, cases uh, for epidemiology, uh, epidemiology investigation. I'm going to leave most of the rest of this the same, except that I know that in this, this instance particularly, there's no data in the last year. Um, there is data from 2019. So I will go ahead and move this back to, oops, other way. Move this back to April 2019. April 28th, 2019. And I also know that, the, and this may be something that causes some issues for uh, your, your, your own instance, but tracked entity data is at the lowest level. So usually it's collected by the facility and so it's only available at that facility. Um, it's not available in an aggregate setting where you're uh, at the visualizing Sierra Leone because no, there are no tracked entities in this data in, at least that are collected with Sierra Leone as their org unit. Uh, so in order to visualize all of the facilities and all of the data in all of Sierra Leone, I need to select the selected and all below option for org units, which shows tracked entities in and all below Sierra Leone. So that means that all of the facilities in all of the Sierra Leone will be um, shown in this output. So I've selected 2019 to 2021. I've selected uh, Sierra Leone and all its children or all the other org units in underneath it. I've selected the relationship type index case to cases, and I've selected malaria entity with the program malaria case diagnosis here. And I'm going to go ahead and add that layer. So you can see that there, there is a little bit of data here. There's not a lot. Um, but you can see that we have a index case, which is has a relationship with several uh, subsequent cases. Um, and you can see in the legend here that our index case is indicated with a red circle. Uh, there's a line to indicate the relationship between that red circle and related cases, which are indicated as a small black dot. Um, and the style tab for this layer, you can also update the, um, the style of those points. So we can make the, the index case bigger. Oops, I'm going to do this as 12. And I'm going to uh, change the related entity style. So right now it's black, but I'm going to make that blue. And I'm going to change the point size to be the same. So I'm going to make it 12 as well. And I'm going to change the line color to be red. So this is going to be a very colorful um, map that we're making here. So now we have our uh, index cases in green, our related cases in blue or purple, and the line of the relationship between them in red. And you could take a picture of that if you wanted to. So this is just a demonstration of the tracked entity layer. Uh, there is a bug in 2.35 uh, latest patch, but the next patch that will be released in, in a few weeks, I believe, um, will be uh, will have a fix for that bug. Um, 
and it's just worth noting that this is a, um, a, a experimental feature for relationships uh, and you may not have the data available for it in your instances, but you can do that with um, the uh, demo data on, on plays uh, on play when the, this next patch comes out. Okay, I saw that there was um, a raised hand, a couple of questions. I think it's time for uh, um, a Q&A. Um, Bjorn, did you want us to take over and start with the Q&A or did, you, uh, did someone have a question that they wanted to, to raise down? I will just uh, briefly before starting Q and also mention a little bit about the Earth Engine layers. Ah, uh, yeah, that's so good. I'll take over. Um, so I see Tuzo has his hand raised. Um, Tuzo, if you can ask your question on the um, uh, on the questions channel in Slack, that would be good. Otherwise, we'll we'll probably open it up for anyone to ask questions after Bjorn uh, talks about the Google Earth Engine layer in maybe ten minutes or so. Okay. Um, so Google Earth Engine, which has not yet been covered, uh, it has been around for a few releases. So probably you also have access to these layers uh, on your instance. So now I'll go back to 235 on the testing instance, uh, workshop instance, and these layers are shown on this road. So they are not named Google Earth Engine, uh, uh, they are just named by the topic. It's more user-friendly. But this layer are hosted by Google, but provided by different organizations uh, for free. And this is greatly improved in 236, but you can still use them in earlier versions. So I've added some exercises that you can do on yourself, we, but I will just show you how you can do it. So one test is to see if Google Earth Engine is enabled on the instance. And then I recommend to you to try to add the elevation layer and just click add layer. And if the layer loads, so you actually see some, some elevation data coming here, uh, it is enabled for instance. If not, you should talk to your system administrator uh, and ask them to, the, the only thing is uh, the setup process is to get some access permissions from Google that you need to add to your instance. And uh, this will be much, much more useful for when you upgrade to 236 when there are, the capabilities are greatly improved. But what you can already do here and also part of the exercise is to check where you live. So to, so to zoom in, you can change the opacity to this layer so you can also see the map below and you can right click anywhere on this map and click elevation and then you will see the elevation at that particular location so here in burundi the the place where i click is 16000 1600 meters above sea level so you can try this yourself uh, now i will move to the 236 that was released just two days ago. So it's available on our demo instance for 236. And what you can do here is that you can aggregate the data provided by Google Earth Engine to your own organization units. And this is something we will look into in detail tomorrow, but then we will do it with a desktop program called QGIS. And the good thing we will do it there is that you don't need to upgrade to be able to do this exercise or to be able to use this data. So, because I guess quite a few of you, you need to wait until you can upgrade instance to 236, but then tomorrow we will show you another way to do the same. Uh, so for population, if you need to know the population within your org units, you could just add a population layer. You can select here how you want to aggregate it. Now I am interested in, in the sum and then add layer. This will take a little bit more time to load because we now need to do this computation on the Google Earth Engine servers and they can be quite intensive, but it will load. And then when you now click on one of your org units, you will see the estimated population within that org unit. And this is great if you have limited census data for your country. Of course, 
this data might not be, it's an estimate, not, not be correct, but uh, tomorrow we will have this data set presented and, and uh, we will tell you the, the benefits and the shortcomings of, of these data sets. Here as well, you can drill down and then we will load the next level, the chief dumps with the population inside. And you can also open this data table here and see, we can, for example, sort by uh, population. We see that this district here uh, has the highest population. And another improvement you can see here in this uh, last latest release is that if you hover the table, we will highlight the org unit in the map. So it's easy to see uh, where it belongs. Uh, we also got a special request for vaccination, COVID vaccination planning, and that is that uh, often you would also like to need, know the age groups to within the different districts. So we also added a new layer with population age groups, and here you can select the age groups you would like to, to use. So for example, if you would like to see the population above 80 years, you can select uh, women about 80 and we could also select men. And then we use the same levels and add layer. So then this will only show the population about 80 years uh, in each district. So we can see here that it's an estimated in the Moyamba district, 682 people above 80 years. And this can also be done for health facilities. So if I go back here, select organization unit, and instead of district, I select facilities, and then in one, uh, I will select Dama in one of the chiefdoms. And then I can set a buffer. So I will still use this five kilometers buffer. What then will happen is that they will make these buffers. And if you click them, you will see that in this hospital, there will be an estimated only 13 in this age group. Of course, these are estimates again, but, um, but we will look more into this tomorrow and you can see and check for your own country how accurate, accurate you think these, these numbers are. So, we have an um, exercise for this. Uh, so the first one was the one I just mentioned with the uh, elevation. Um, this one you can try yourself because also with the, on the 236, you can check the highest elevation within your org units. Uh, the last one I can show you, which is a little bit different. That is the land cover data sets. So the question is, what is the dominant land cover, land use in one district? So if I go back to the maps app and I go on new map, I will use this land cover. And then I will select an organization unit and select Western area and add layer. So this will also aggregate the data shown here. This is showing different land use. So urban is red. So this is urban areas. And if I click on this, I will see that the most dominant land use or land cover in Western area is Savannah by almost 40%. So this is also now something you can do from 236 with your own country and organization units as these data sets are global. So that was a short demo. Uh, you can try this on your own afterwards. We will now look briefly at the questions. So I think I'll take this one over here. I saw that it was where was some questions uh, about the legends from Leslie. So we had one question if you could create manual 
class divisions in thematic layers. So because we had have these automatic ones that are uh, equal counts or equal intervals. And there are also other possibilities. There's something called natural breaks, for example, which sort of tries to read your data and, and make a best guess of, of how you should divide the classes. So here we also need some feedback for you if you would like to have more options than we have. Uh, if you want to set uh, manual class divisions, you can't do that in the Maps app, but you can do it by creating a predefined legend. So I can just briefly show you where that, that is done. So if I go to the maintenance app, and then I can search for uh, legend. So here you have under other, you have a legend entry where you can modify and create new legends. So I will just go and have a list view of, these are all the legends on the demo instance that we have. And then, so we, for example, see the weight in kilo, we can edit it. And here you can see that you can type in the, the start and end values uh, as you like, and basically create your own classes. And you can also click on this and pick your own color. So here you have all flexibility of, of creating custom legends. And then if you are editing, and if I go back or editing an indicator, So I go back here, and if I'm editing an indicator, uh, you will see that there is also a legend here. So you can associate the legends that you would like to associate with, with this indicator. I recommend only selecting one, and then this one will be uh, selected by default in the Maps app to make it easier for your users. Uh, let me see. So there is also a question if what happens if you drill down, uh, will the classes be the same? And um, I can show you that if I go back to the maps app. And then I'm adding a new layer. I use automatic color legend equal intervals for classes. Sorry, I went a little bit fast. <laughs> and then uh, if I then drill down, you can see the classes here, 53, starting from 53.9, 146. And then if I drill down, it will be different. So I do see the need of the possibility of this legend to be the same. And you can achieve this by creating a predefined legend. Uh, the reason why we don't do this for automatic legends is that we don't know what the user will do. So, and we don't have all the data available when we create the legends. So that's why we need to adapt this when the user is, is drilling up and down. So the way to fix this or find a, a way around it is to use a predefined legend if you want them to stay the same. Um, and then if you could change the colors and transparency of the buffers, I don't think you can. Um, there are buffer support for different layers, but if we, we use this for the facilities layer, so to select facility type, facility, and then turn on the buffer. So this will always have this bluish uh, color. Uh, you can change the opacity by doing this. It will also change the opacity of the icon. If you would like to be able to change the color and maybe the opacity of only the buffer, please send us a feature request. And that is something we can, can look into. Uh, if you have buffers for events, the event buffer will have the same color, just brighter. That, uh, uh, that 
the same color as the event itself. Uh, could you take over a bit, Austin? Sure. Um, I don't think there were a ton more questions, but I saw two that came in that we could uh, look at here. Um, one is uh, the most recent one. What's the difference between the two options for period in tracked entity layer? Um, so Bjorn, if I'm, I'm going to take over your screen. Um, and I have this here. So the question is about these two options in the period dialogue um, when you're creating a tracked entity layer. Um, so there are a number of different dates that we could be talking about when we're talking about events, uh, particularly tracked entity uh, events. So a tracked entity has an enrollment in a particular program. For instance, you might enroll a mother in the antenatal care program. Um, you might enroll a, um, a person with a particular disease in the program for that disease. Um, and the date when that person is added to that program or when they first visit a health facility in most cases is when they are enrolled in that program, which is this second option here. So if you want to show and all people that were enrolled in this, in this case, we're looking at malaria case diagnosis. So malaria entity, if we're showing the moment that that person was added to the malaria um, uh, program, then we show the, select the second option uh, and we can choose the dates that we care about. If we want to instead see the, the when that person or the tracked entity was last updated within this program, we can select this first option. And in that case, if someone is enrolled, for instance, in a um, uh, malaria program, and then they are given uh, anti-malarial uh, drugs at a later date, they might be enrolled on uh, April the 1st, and then they're given uh, a, a follow-up visit on April the 15th, maybe. Um, the last updated would be the last time data was entered for that tracked entity or that person um, in that program. And that's when you would select this first option. So hopefully that makes that a little bit more clear. Um, other questions here? There was another question which was uh, quite good about um, using locations in data sets, um, which is aggregate data. Uh, that I believe is not currently supported um, in the maps application to visualize the uh, a data element from an aggregate program on the map. Um, Bjorn, correct me if I'm wrong on that. I might, I think that's correct. Yeah, I think that's correct too. Um, but if that is something that is useful and that would be another good uh, feature request, that sounds like an interesting use case. Um, you can of course collect that information in a tracker program uh, and then visualize it in that way or, or as um, anonymous events as well. Um, but if you're collecting those in a data set in the data entry application, I believe there is not currently a way to visualize that on the map. There are some technical challenges in terms of how you um, determine what the geography associated with different values in that data element are. Um, and that's not currently supported in DHS2. Uh, I see there is one question about printing out a map. I'm not sure if I'm answering correctly, but uh, I've not been covering that. So I'll show you that in the Maps app, you can download. We don't have a print option, uh, but you can download the map. And then you have a few options here. You can decide uh, a little bit depending on the shape of the country, where the, which corner the legends should be. Uh, the name will only be shown if you have saved the map, because then you actually add a name to it as well. And then you can click the download button. And if you click on this, that will be just an image that you can print or use in your presentations or, or whatever. So there, this works. So basically, what you see on the screen is what you get in the print. So if you want a different ratio or a different view, you can just adapt what you see here. And whenever what you see when you click download is what you get uh, downloaded.
There was another question here in, uh, it was asked in exercise four, but it relates to something that was asked earlier as well. And that's about uh, creating the, um, the org unit geometries which we did not cover uh, today. It may be a little bit much to, to cover here in terms of what how you create that information. Um, but that is something that would, you would use the import export application to import um, a shape file or a GeoJSON file um, for your uh, boundaries of different levels, different organization unit levels for your country. So you might have boundaries for the national level for the district level, for the um, maybe the county level, uh, and then also the points for individual facilities in your country. Uh, and you can import those into the DHS2 system, uh, not through the MAPS application. Uh, that might be a little bit outside of scope uh, for, for that today. So yeah, I agree. And I, this is also so important that you have this in your on your instance, because you can't use the MAPS app without it, or just very little of it. So I think what I would suggest here is you can contact us directly. We might also send out an email to this list and ask who are struggling with this part. And then I think we could have a, a separate workshop just for this group. Uh, because it's not useful to have these all together because this is a one-time task. It's only the system administrators who do it. But please uh, give us some feedback if you would like us to have a separate workshop just on on adding uh, coordinates to your org units. And we will help out. There was also a, a good uh, response to that question. So OSM, which is the, the data source for the base maps is called, uh, it's an acronym for Open Street Map. Um, and you can, uh, anyone can suggest edits to that uh, Open Street Map data. Um, it's not part of DHIS2 at all, but you can uh, contribute to OpenStreetMap. I believe it's OpenStreetMap.org um, that you can uh, add or edit data if it is incorrect in that base map. And eventually it will show up also in the, um, the data that's coming into your DHIS2 system. Uh, but I would recommend if you're looking at uh, targeting interventions or using uh, things like county boundaries or facility locations in your DHS2, in DHS2 to, to uh, target your health innovations or health interventions, um, that you import that data directly to DHS2 instead so that you can use it uh, directly because otherwise it will just be kind of an image in the background of your system. I see that we get a suggestion to be able to support manual legends in the maps app and uh, uh, I think it's a good idea. So I will create a, a feature request for that and then we'll see. You can, you can word it up if it should be prioritized, but it's something we can definitely add. I think it's also useful often in other GIS application, you can see a histogram, which means you can see like a chart of of your distribution of your values and then how the classes will, will affect that. And I think that is, would also be a nice feature to, to have. Um, and then we, yes, there has been quite a lot of things happening under the hood um, in the database. So there is a question now that the, the formats has changed. So the, the big change is that we have introduced uh, something called post GIS, uh, which is quite a long time ago. Uh, and then we have also switched. So we are no longer storing coordinates in text fields that we did before, but in, uh, in the proper geometry fields, which have better control that they are correct, uh, that the latitude longitude is not out of, uh, about 180 and, and so on. So, and I think from the database directly, you can export GML and CSV file, but then you need database access, but you can download all your org units in GeoJSON format, which is uh, more used than GML. And that we will uh, do tomorrow. That will be a big part of the, of the program tomorrow.
So uh, the presentation is shared in PDF. Is that okay? If not, I can also share it as a PowerPoint. Uh, I will do it here directly in the channel. Uh, also, uh, remember that we have a Q&A tomorrow uh, at the same time. So if you have more questions, we can we also do it tomorrow. I know, uh, and I'm sorry for that, but uh, a few of you are hungry. I saw there was a demand for, for a lunch break. Uh, <laughs> So we have this, the, like this, the three hours that is compulsory, and then this part is, is uh, optional. Tomorrow we will do the same. So please make sure you have a little bit food uh, before we start tomorrow, because we will run through the same program tomorrow. So lunch needs to be after we are done. So please keep some snack or something to keep you, keep you going. Uh, there is a question about uh, having to show data labels in the maps app. So, so far uh, we only show the names and then you need to hover it to see the show the value. So I think we could, uh, we should improve that. So you can also in, you can display the value directly on the map. So it's not yet possible, but uh, it's, uh, I will uh, create the feature request for that one. I'm wondering if we should stop now. And then if you have more questions, please keep them for, for tomorrow. Or do you have anything to add, Austin? No, I haven't seen any major questions come up. Um, just want one thing to say about, um, uh, we've mentioned a couple of times that people can create feature requests if they want to, to add something. To do that, you go to the DHIS2 JIRA instance. So in order to do that, you can go to uh, dhis2.org. There should be a link there to JIRA, but you can also go directly to JIRA, J-I-R-A uh, dhis2.org. Maybe Bjorn, since you have the shared map, maybe you can share that. Um, sure. I can also share my screen. Um, yeah, I'll stop sharing. Sure. So as you can see here, there is jira.dhis2.org. Uh, you can then uh, create an account or log in if you already have one, uh, and you can create a new issue that you can uh, bring up to us. So if you create a new issue, you can select the, oops, sorry, this will be the DHIS2 project is the one that is always here. Uh, most people will only see this one, I think. You will then see the feature, uh, you can have a description, um, the feature, you can select the maps application here and then describe exactly in detail what, what you want it and why. And also if, uh, once you've created this issue, you can go to this, the issue that is created here. And then you can also vote. So if you, there is an issue that someone else has created, you can search for it in using the search field. If there's an issue that someone else has created or you know that other people would like the issue that you have created or the feature, you can vote uh, for this as well. Um, because I created this, this uh, issue, I can't vote for it. But if more people vote, then we see it and we know that it is something that a lot of people want. So that's something else that you can do. Uh, when you have created an issue or someone else has created an issue with a feature in JIRA. Just wanted to point that out. So the present, yeah, I've shared now the presentation also in the questions um, thread. Uh, it is shared other places as well. And also remember that uh, this is recorded and will be available on the YouTube channel. So if you missed some parts of the workshop today, you should be able to, to watch it later. So I then suggest that we end here and meet again tomorrow, 10 o'clock our time. So, so thanks a lot for joining. You might still ask questions. The Slack, Slack will be open. <laughs> so you can still ask questions here and we will try to reply or, or do it tomorrow. So, so I hope it was useful today and uh, Thank you for joining and then see you again, again tomorrow.
hosted. Yep. Thank you all very much.